welcome. Today I will be discussing the tragic tale of Fulgrim, Primarch of the Emperor's Children. I will not be discussing every event in Fulgrim's life, but rather the highlights and some of the key moments that really affect his character. Some of the points I do make are definitely up to my own opinion, but I hope it gives a better understanding of the character, especially in the Horus Heresy era and in the modern 40k timeline. With that said, I hope you all enjoy. As we begin the Primarch story, we find that Fulgrim is teleported from his birthplace upon Terra. Fulgrim's gestation capsule crashes on a destitute mining world known as Chemos, placed in the Ultima Segmentum. Unfortunately, life on Chemos could better be described as a fight for survival as it is an unforgiving and barren planet. It is said that it is only illuminated in perpetual twilight. The human inhabitants of Chemos began as miners. They colonized the planet during the Dark Age of Technology over 5,000 years prior. Unfortunately, with the Age of Strife, nearly all progress is lost as humanity begins to regress and lose a majority of its innovation. The entirety of the Camosian people had to work nearly every hour of their solar day, perpetually using resource synthesizers to, to sustain themselves. As you could imagine, the effect on the human population of this incredibly harsh daily routine it leaves little to no time for pursuits or goals outside of survival. However, events would soon change their fate. In Millennium 29, scouts venturing out from the fortress factory of Kallax soon discovered the crash site of the fallen gestation capsule. Clearing through dust and wreckage, they discover an infant boy. This must have been truly bizarre, and I personally believe that they most likely interpreted this boy as being sent to them, or as some kind of gift. The scouts begged the Kallax leaders to spare his life, as orphans were routinely discarded so that they would not burden the resources. They truly believed that the boy was special. The boy was spared, and he was given into the hands of one of his rescuers, a member from the caretakers, to raise as his own. A truly unheard of decision to a Camosian. They gave him guidance, food, family, and a name. Fulgrim. The early life of Fulgrim was at the bottom of Kallax's society as a standard factory worker. He began processing recycled waste for scraps of nutrients just for the next day. For these early years, this was the only life that he knew. But to Fulgrim it was very apparent that he was different or special. After working with the resource synthesizers for years, he began to contemplate their improvement. He began modifying and upgrading the technology through his inbuilt genius in his Primarch genetics. 
Though it is not said, it is inferred that he did this for his peers and his adopted family, as a Primarch would have had no trouble surviving on their own, and would not have needed to put himself through the trouble of improving the lives of those around him. The people began to trust and have faith in this young man, enough to make him an executive at the age of 15. As an executive, he learned the fate of Kemos and the state of the dying world. I personally believe that now is when he decided that he would not abandon the people to a miserable life and would try to save Kemos. The planet's fate had changed. Under Fulgrim's direction, the teams of engineers travelled far from Kallax and the other fortress factories, reclaiming and repairing. Mining production skyrocketed as the resources began to pour in. Kemos's mines were actually producing a surplus for the first time in decades, allowing the world to begin to purchase food and other needed materials in larger quantities from passing traders. The planet had begun to transform with the emergence of new cities, nature, and revamped colonization. Fulgrim was now recognized as the planetary leader, and the people experienced the re-emergence of Camosian art and culture. It was Fulgrim's dream for his people to have a better life than the poverty that they knew. Arts and culture comes across to Fulgrim as the ultimate goal. He most likely viewed the ability to experience leisure as success because of the life he led as a boy where it was completely unobtainable. Grand cities and architectural projects dotted the planet as the entire world had begun to progress and move away from the slow decay. The progress of the mining death world had not gone unnoticed, nor the story of a unique human uniting an entire planet. After 50 years, the Great Crusade had reached Kemos. A golden eagled stormbird descended from the sky. These strangers were invited to Kallax to meet with Fulgrim personally, as he took one look at the being before him, and without a word, he dropped to his knees. A shining figure clad in ornate armour. The man's presence filled him with hope and pride. A truly civilised and refined pinnacle of humanity? What stood before him was his father, the Emperor of Mankind. Maybe for the first time in his life, Fulgrim saw perfection. If one moment could be said to have completely altered Fulgrim's life, it would be the seizure of the infamous Layer Blade. This journey begins with the Emperor's Great Crusade. Progress was consistent with the unification of humanity through the Primarchs and their respective legions. After many years of the Third Legion operating at reduced numbers alongside Horus, Fulgrim had finally built up the numbers and the strength to set off on his own 
independent 28th Expeditionary Fleet. The beginning of the choices that would lead him down the path of betrayal begin with the discovery of the Great Temple, located on the island of Laeron. The Emperor's children were embroiled in battle with the alien species known as the Leia. Described as snake-like lower bodies with insectoid heads and multi-limbed. Although the Leia supposedly genetically and chemically modified their bodies to better suit their tactical environment, the Leia altered and butchered themselves as ominously they held perfection as their utmost tenant of their society. This war with the Leia inflicted heavy losses for the Third Legion, mostly due to Fulgrim's promise to shorten the timeline of the conquest from decades to a mere month. During the closing hours of the conflict, Fulgrim and his legions scavenged the temple on the island of Laeron, unaware of the existence of chaos at the time and holding to the Imperial Truth, they could not fully grasp what they had really discovered. The temple's potent residual warp energy would begin to affect the Emperor's children expedition, clouding their minds like an unnerving feeling or sickness. Fulgrim discovered what the Leia had fought to the death to conceal. As Fulgrim's eyes gazed upon it, it was a tall, silver sword with a gently curved blade and a crude amethyst gem set in the pommel. The temptation for the Primarch was too great. He could see it. The reward for his impeccable strategy, his legion's hard-fought victory, a perfect fit to be strapped to his waist. Fulgrim claimed the blade as his own, though this was no ordinary blade, as sealed within was a greater demon of the chaos god Slanesh. The demon within began whispering in his mind and corrupting his soul towards the service of Slanesh. Over the years of the Great Crusade, he began thinking that whispers were in his mind and that it was his own subconscious speaking to him. The whispers begin small, almost a mimic of any person's inner thoughts and feelings. It might have started as subconsciously having deeper grand illusions of himself the son of the Emperor of Mankind, being named after a Chemosian deity, conquering the whole galaxy with highly educated and cultured warriors, purging Xenos that could not withstand the might of mankind. Fulgrim most lightly thought even more highly of himself compared to that of a mortal man and his accomplishments. Unfortunately, the Leia Blade would slowly accentuate these feelings, and in turn, this slow corruption began to influence the Third Legion as they strive to live up to the ever-increasing standards of their gene father. Creative and martial pursuits of the Legion would be pushed further each time over the next decades, the Legion will strive further towards their goal of perfection, ever distancing themselves from their humanity. Each time some new sensation was explored, it left the desire to seek the next goal and to the more extreme. At a pinnacle point during the beginning of Millennium 31, Fulgrim met with the legendary Eldar Farseer, Eldrad Ulthran, 
of Craft World at Ulthway. The Farseer pleaded with Fulgrim and revealed that Horus had been wounded by the chaotic artifact known as the Kinner Branch Anathame. The mortal wound had allowed the Chaos Gods to gain an influence and to corrupt the War Master's soul, despite the intervention of Magnus the Red. Fulgrim's philosophy was that only humanity were capable of his version of perfection and he viewed Xenos distasteful and lesser than. The Xenos before him were accusing him of one of his most beloved brothers, his family, of being tainted. This must have filled the Primarch with unbelievable rage. His anger was further fueled and stoked by the Demon Blade. The blade wanted the Primer to reject Eldrad's words, and it led Fulgrim to launch an unprovoked attack on Eldrad. In the battle that followed, the Emperor's children slew both an accompanying Eldar Wraith Lord and a potent avatar of Cain. This forced the Farseer and the other Eldar troops to sorrowfully withdraw. The Eldar had proven themselves treacherous and liars. Fulgrim listened to the whispers in his head. In his rage, he ordered the destruction of several beautiful Eldar maiden worlds using virus bombs. The Demon Blade's influence was showing, guiding him to send the Eldari traitors to their graves, or in reality to the embrace of Slanesh. Seeking answers for the Xenos' filthy accusations, Fulgrim sought an audience with his brother. Reuniting with Horus, he demanded answers, but he was met with a proposition, a carefully crafted speech to turn Fulgrim to his side. Fulgrim's admiration for Horus allowed Chaos to find its own way deeper into his heart. All of Fulgrim's life he had pursued perfection, things denied him and the people of Chemos. This may have left him feeling entitled to it. With his judgement weakened by the years of use by the Layer Blade, all Horus had to do was deliver the right words to the brother that he knew so well. Words such as, the Emperor holds us back, he does not care for humanity, he is the only obstacle for us to achieve true perfection for mankind. Fulgrim was enticed by the future that Horus painted and agreed to join him in rebellion. The traitor Primarchs, before declaring their rebellion, made moves to purge the Imperial Loyalist elements from their legions. A large majority of these Marines were the Terran-born Astartes, who would not survive the infamous Istvan III massacre. Despite the pride and the arrogance that the Third Legion and Fulgrim were known for, they still had noble qualities. Perfection in serving as examples of the best of humanity. Not just mindless warriors, but scholars, artists, and diplomats. But this would be discarded, as Fulgrim had made up his decision to cast aside his weakness. His new perfection would not be a path that aligned with the Emperor. Fulgrim now shows complete disregard for soldiers that had served with him for decades and viewed him as a father figure because of his view 
on perfection have been twisted. Warriors that hold loyal to the Emperor and are unwilling to follow on the journey of excess were not worthy. With this diseased arm cut off the body of the Legion, the search for new sensations would be rampant. This leads on to the infamous performance upon Fulgrim's flagship, the Pride of the Emperor. The event was prepared. Famed composer Bekwa Kinska prepared her ultimate masterpiece, performed for Fulgrim and all assembled Astartes of the Emperor's children. Afflicted with Slaneshi corruption, Kinska had created new musical instruments for a performance piece worthy of the Primarch. The performance began to disorientate the audience and it rose to a fevered frenzy throughout the ship. Ultimately, the music summoned five lesser demons of Slanesh, known as demonettes, from the warp who possessed the bodies of Kinska and several of her singers. This eventually reached a fever pitch of divinely performed madness. Such an experience of excess must have felt like a reward to Fulgrim, reaffirming his decisions. It was during this performance that the Emperor's children finally gave themselves both body and soul to the Prince of Pleasure. They would salvage the instruments from this performance to create the prototypes for the first noise marines that would see battle on Isfahan 5. The drop site massacre is almost incomprehensible in its proportions of death and destruction to the average person. Ferris Manus of the Primarch of the Iron Hands Legion have been tasked to bring the traitors to heel at the head of the loyalist host. As the first waves of troops crashed against each other, thousands perished every minute. There truly was no turning back for the Third Legion as they held the centre line. Soldiers that had fought side by side throughout the entire galaxy and had forged deep bonds of brotherhood had shattered that trust. Deep feelings of betrayal and hatred would rise to the surface on both sides and would fight with fury never seen before. The scale of the conflict would have been overwhelming, with explosions taller than skyscrapers, masses of fallen bodies so thick it was impossible to wade through. The Third Legion would fight day and night, head on against their previously closest brother legion, the Iron Hands. Though now the sight of the Third Legion would have truly shocked the Loyalist forces, as they had begun to embrace the more physical aspects of Slaneshi corruption. Driven by anger or grief, or perhaps both, Ferris had made a direct charge to confront his brother alongside his elite Morlocks. Fulgrim began to taunt his brother, treating it like a game. As the loyalists were being slaughtered, Fulgrim must have felt arrogant and superior. As the tide began to shift, he must have felt he had proved himself and his legion superior. The two Primarchs traded violent blows, wounding one another deeply during their fierce struggle. As Ferris pushed himself to his feet and staggered towards the wounded Fulgrim, he cried out and brought down the flaming blade towards his brother's neck. But Fulgrim lashed out as he drew the single-edged, demonically-possessed sword. 
with Seleneshi corruption pouring from the blade, diabolical strength flooded Fulgrim's limbs as he pushed against the power of Ferris Manus. Feeling his brother's surprise and his resistance, Fulgrim managed to surge to his feet and struck out, his layer blade biting deep into the breastplate of Ferris's armour, and the Primarch of the Iron Hands cried out, crumbling to his knees once again. Fulgrim had proved that he was the better warrior, and raised his sword above his head. His grip was locked onto the weapon, ready to strike. Then he froze. He lightly asked himself, why? Why was he trying to kill his closest friend in the galaxy? He looked around him and saw warriors that once held the greatest respect for each other, fighting to the death. Was this perfection? Is this what he had envisioned as a boy on Camus, dreaming about raising humanity up? It's my personal belief that Fulgrim was so easily convinced by Horus because he is the most insecure of all the Primarchs. If he could be the perfect human, he could rid his feelings of shame for being a poor adopted boy in a factory on Chemos. The future that Horus painted was almost too good to be true, and now he realised that it was. As this realisation dawned on Fulgrim, he saw out of the corner of his eye Ferris reaching for his fallen sword. Fulgrim's blade seemed to move with a life of its own, and it swung down. Fulgrim tried desperately to pull the blow, but he was no longer in control. The demonic blade sliced the genetically enhanced flesh and bone. The Iron Hand's Primarch fell to the ground, his head separated from his body. Fulgrim looked down at his brother's lifeless body, and his mind became shattered with grief. Fulgrim had been discovered by the Emperor at a similar time to Ferris Manus, and thus they were close from the beginning. They most likely shared the closest bond between all of the Primarch brothers, as they also held a similar worldview in the strive for excellence. They had shared countless battlefields together, forging a friendship that had lasted centuries. But Fulgrim had thrown it all away and betrayed his brother because his idea of perfection was more important. Truly shocked with what he had done, it's likely that he had completely lost his will to fight. And at this point, the voice that he had believed to be his subconscious told him to let go. That he did not have to bear this burden. The layer blade he had taken all those years ago spoke directly to him and offered him peace. Fulgrim is shamed by what he has done, and thus he agrees to the demon's request. The Slaneshi demon takes control of his body and seals his consciousness inside a painting, in some way trying to free himself from the guilt of his own actions. The progression of Fulgrim's story will begin with some conjecture on my part. From what I see as a point of Fulgrim's full corruption is not fully explored or left purposely vague. This takes place following his surrender to the Layer Blade's demon. 
Trapped inside a painting that resided in his flagship, Fulgrim takes on this mental transformation after escaping his cage. There are hints that during this time, Fulgrim's consciousness or soul experience what could be the realm under Slanesh's control in the warp. Recovering slightly from the shock of the events upon Isfahan 5, he would have realised his predicament. This was not the freedom from burden and the guilt he felt from his betrayal, and unwilling to be trapped here forever. He must have searched for a way to free himself. With the timeline of events in the Horus Heresy, it is clear that he was at least initially unsuccessful as the demon unconvincingly paraded around in his body. At first he must have resisted his surroundings and been shocked by the very things that he perceived. But the Fulgrim now was not the Primarch that he once was. He no longer had a strong enough will to resist the offers of release before him. It is stated that when he reclaims his body, he explains to his legion that he learned of Warpcraft and the infallible ways of demon kind. He eventually was unable to use this newly acquired arcane knowledge to force the demon out of his immortal body, swapping places with the foul entity and trapping it within the portrait for all time. Usually for someone to learn something, you have to be taught. And the price of the knowledge and power he needed to free himself was absolute corruption. It is clear that the Fulgrim who returned from the painting was not the same, that he had embraced chaos and with his new knowledge of reality and warpcraft, his ideas of perfection had changed. He would achieve this for himself, for only he, chosen of Slanesh, was worthy. As the Horus Heresy progressed, Fulgrim enacted his plan for achieving perfection, and he soon joined forces with Perturabo, Primarch of the Iron Warriors, promising a worthy prize. The two joined forces in a quest to tip the balance of the rebellion into Horus's favour. They journeyed into the Eye of Terror to retrieve a weapon known as the Angel Exterminatus. Shortly before they were to leave, Fulgrim uncharacteristically gifted his brother an amulet known as the Maljata Stone. Fulgrim by this time is a arrogant and selfish Primarch, and this gesture should have tipped off Perturabo. But he was naive, and would come to underestimate his brother. They soon landed on the crone world known as Yidris. The Emperor's children and the Iron Warriors had to contend with an army of Wraithguard and Wraith Lords that had awoken from a deep slumber to defend their home. At the height of this brutal struggle, Perturabo noticed that he had lost sight of his brother. This sent feelings of uneasiness, and he pushed further throughout the Eldar Citadel to pursue him. They both soon arrived in a massive spherical chamber, and Fulgrim revealed to his brother that there was no Angel Exterminatus, but rather was to become the weapon mass destruction. Betrayed by his brother, Perturabo attempted to attack Fulgrim, but he felt his body fail, and he slumped to his knees. 
Fulgrim activated the Maljata's stone that Perturabo wore, draining his very essence. Now, with the Iron Warrior's Primarch power in hand, Fulgrim revealed the full purpose of his plan. He was going to achieve apotheosis. He would sacrifice his own brother and evolve into a demon. The heretical ritual was initiated. However, Fulgrim's moment of glory would not go uninterrupted as an ambush of salamanders, iron hands, and raven guard who had been stalking the traitor fleet in search of vengeance since the drop site massacre. The loyalist Astartes charged at the traitors, and during the crossfire they shattered the Maljata stone. Perturabo grasped his warhammer and looked to his brother. He saw no remorse in his brother's eyes, only sadistic joy. Anything left of the man, Fulgrim, was gone. Perturabo raised his warhammer and struck his brother. Fulgrim's body exploded under the impact, and the cry of release was a shrieking scream. A violent explosion filled the area with blinding light. A rebirth in fire and hate. Every eye in the chamber was turned to the centre, and through slitted fingers and shimmering reflections, the survivors of the fighting bore witness to something magnificent and haunting. An agonising death and a violent rebirth. A figure floated in the midst of the light, and it took a moment for Perturabu to recognise the impossibility of what he was seeing. It was Fulgrim, bare and pristine, his body unsullied by any flaws. Fulgrim's back arched, and his bones split with gunshot cracks, his flesh once so perfect, now ran fluid and malleable, his form moulding and remoulding as though an invisible sculptor carved and moulded him like clay. Fulgrim's legs extended and lengthened, fusing together in a writhing serpent's tail, the skin thickening and sheening with reptilian scales and segmented plates of chitinous armour. Fulgrim was human no longer, but twisted into a vile creature that resembled the Laeron he destroyed decades ago. A form stronger, faster, and no longer bared the burdens of human guilt and insecurity. Fulgrim the man was dead, replaced by Fulgrim the demon Primarch. As we join the current 40k timeline, 10,000 years after the apotheosis, we find that Fulgrim and his legion are fully emerged in the lifestyle of excess. Due to the nature of chaos itself, the unity of the Emperor's children was never really possible. We find the Third Legion is split into war bands, roaming the galaxy, committing atrocities in the search of unexplored sensations and the favour of Slanesh. More often than not, they are in conflict with the other traitor legions, as they compete for artefacts, sacrifices, or the attention of their deity. Fulgrim 
barely fits any description that could be human as the serpentine demon Primarch wallows in excess upon the Slaneshi world deep in the eye of terror. At this time, it could be safe to assume that he now fully believes that he achieved his goal of perfection, an all-powerful being that simply gets to indulge in reward for eternity. However, events close to the modern 40k timeline put a new perspective on the Primarch. Whilst Fulgrim remained mostly uninvolved in the material universe, his legion has been active. The former chief apothecary to the Third Legion during the Great Crusade and Horus Heresy, Fabius Bile has remained at large. As his fellow space marines lost themselves to corruption, Bile moved further and further along his own dark path. He left Holy Terror shortly before Horus's defeat at the hands of the Emperor, accompanied by a handful of his most gifted acolytes. Bile's warband moved throughout the war-torn Imperium on a journey of research into the depths of genetic manipulation. Wherever he strode, the rogue offered his assistance in exchange for prisoners, genetic samples, and ancient texts. Despite his infamy, Bile still adhered to a twisted version of the old imperial truth, believing that only the foolish and weak sought the comfort of gods like the ruinous powers, and the pursuit of scientific truth was to be held above all other values. This is perhaps the influence of the doctrine of the old Third Legion, before excess and corruption. His knowledge could transform mediocre defensive troops into ravaging super soldiers, and his mastery of the cloning process saw him able to mobilize thousands of perfect warriors within mere months. As a consequence, genocide and genetic debasement marked his path, and his hubris led him to even attempt to clone the Primarchs. Before the start of the 41st millennium, we rejoin Fabius Bile as he revisits one of his old and abandoned laboratories. Sifting through wreckage and piles of rubble, he finally makes his way through the facility, examining for salvageable materials. He finally happens upon a tank. He examines it, and he takes notice of the movement within. He looks closer to examine the tube, and he sees a child with perfect features and purple eyes stare back at him. A clone of Fulgrim. This is a version of Fulgrim. Unlike all of Bile's previous attempts at recreating his gene sire, this was an exact copy, as pure as the original, before his corruption to Slanesh. Why this clone of Fulgrim succeeded is a complete mystery to Fabius, and it baffles him. The cloning tank cracks, and Fabius Bile catches the infant into his arms his feelings conflicting within him to the Primarch that he remembered and the demon that existed now. Fabius spares the boy, and this new incarnation of Fulgrim aged to maturity rapidly as he had before. Some years beyond this event, 
Favia's bile is hunted by an Emperor's Children war band that seek revenge upon the Clone Lord. In stark contrast to the honourable legions of the past, the warband are nothing but twisted and corrupted Astartes rifled with mutation. As the warband forces push upon Bile, they stop dead in their tracks as they are set upon by a looming human figure. As they aim for a kill shot, the traitor marines cannot do it. As to their horror, they see Fulgrim, their Primarch, covered in rudimentary armour bounding towards them. The traitor warband cannot comprehend that a human Fulgrim is before them and almost can't believe their own eyes. The Primarch bellows out to his sons to stop. He reveals that he's not just Fulgrim, but Fulgrim with all of his memories from the Great Crusade and Horus Heresy. This version of Fulgrim expressed great regret for his actions during those conflicts and his eventual turn to chaos and he vowed that he would do all that he could to atone for his sins, his murder of Ferris Manus, and his betrayal of the Emperor's cause. This is a Fulgrim that truly has perspective of the path in pursuit of perfection, that he abandoned the ideals that he held before his corruption to strive to be an example to humanity through being more than just soldiers, but a herald of culture and excellence. We have such a progression of his character as we see the man he could have been without his corruption. A prideful and arrogant demon compared to the flawed but honourable man. The cloned Fulgrim spoke passionately to the warband, condemning his demon counterpart and vowed to lead his third legion on a better path. Instead, before he could undertake any actions, Vile betrayed his creation into the hands of the Necron Overlord Trazen the Infinite. Bile feared that for all the cloned Fulgrim's passion and denouncement of his demon counterpart's actions, this Fulgrim was the same man and would end up making all the same mistakes and poor choices as before. The resurrected Primarch became a part of the Necron's collection of important historical figures on his tomb world. There he waits in stasis, unable to save his legion or to destroy the serpentine beast that he was or is. Thank you all for watching. This was my first attempt at doing anything remotely like this, and I definitely learned a lot during this first episode. Hopefully you guys walk away with a better understanding of why Fulgrim the character makes some of the decisions and ultimately falls down the path of corruption. If anyone has any thoughts or feelings that they want to share I'm definitely up for discussing that but once again thank you for watching <laughs>